All right, this first system I'm going to solve by graphing. So I'm going to plot the y-intercept, negative 2 for the first equation. It has a slope of 5. I go up 5 over 1, draw a line through there. And then the second equation has a y-intercept of 4. It has a slope of 1. I go up 1 and over 1. And where these lines intersect, it seems to not be a whole number, but it seems to be in like the center of a box. So it seems to be between 1 and 2, between 5 and 6. So I would guess it's 1.5 and 5.5. So solving by graphing, not great if the numbers aren't whole numbers. So I'm going to check just to be sure by doing it by substitution. Since both of the equations are solved for y, I set both of those expressions equal to each other. And so I'll solve for the x value. Divide uh, 6 by 4 here. 6 divided by 4 is 3 halves. That checks out. That's the same as 1.5. I can substitute then that x value into either of the equations for y. The second equation is easier, 11 halves or 5.5 is the y coordinate. So these are intersecting lines, they're consistent, which means they have a solution and they're independent because they have only one solution. Really you just need to know that you can find the solution to both of those equations. So I'm going to solve this one again by graphing. I don't like them being written in standard form if I want to graph them, so I get the y by itself. You can see here I'm putting them in slope intercept form really quickly. I notice that they have the same slope. Well, if they have the same slope, they're going to be parallel lines, but I'll, I'll graph them anyway. So this one has a y-intercept of four and a half. Again, not too pleasant plotting y-intercepts with like fractions. The second equation, I'll plot this one uh, in a different color. Uh, it has the same slope, different y-intercept. They're parallel lines which means they're not going to intersect. They're inconsistent, so it has no solution. But the answer to this is no solution. There's no solution to that system. So you don't have to say inconsistent or worry about that. You just have to know that there is no solution. Uh, this one right here, if I solve using substitution, um, one of the equations is already solved for y. So I take that value of y and plug it into the y of the first equation. Re remember to distribute the negative. So I'm going to get the x by itself, divide 2 by 5 hundredths, and I get 40. Since x equals 40, I can take that and plug it into either of the y's of either equation. I choose to plug it into the second equation. So I get y equals 2 plus 25 hundredths times 40, and so I get y equals 12. Just to be sure that I'm doing it right, and maybe you'd prefer to do this by elimination, I'm going to, I'm going to show you how to do this using elimination really quickly. So let's say uh, the second equation is not in standard form. i got to move the 0.25x to the left, so it becomes a negative 0.25x. The y's automatically eliminate because they're, it's a 1 and a negative 1. You still get x equals 40 and y equals 12. You can even, if you want, solve it using matrices. Since this is, again, in standard form, plug that in there. Do the RREF, which stands for row reference echelon form, now that you need to know that. But there you go, x equals y, 40 equals 12, uh, well, x equals 40, y equals 12. Three methods to solve that equation. You can choose any one you want. Really. Um, I'm going to solve this one using elimination. The problem here is that it's not in standard form. So you notice I'm rewriting that second equation. The x has to come first, and then the y has to come second. So I'm going to um, multiply the second equation by 2. But I notice that all the x's, all the y's cancel out, and so does the number, like the negative 3. And so what I get is a true statement, but it's infinite in many solutions. So these are the same line. Um, that's why the answer is infinite in many, many solutions. The line intersects itself everywhere. Um, for our number 5, I'm going to solve this one using elimination. I'm going to choose to enter, uh, eliminate the y first. So I'll multiply the second equation by negative 4. And I get x equals 3 once I simplify. Or you could have chosen to eliminate the x first. But you have to do something to both equations. Um, the first equation I multiplied by negative 2. The second equation I multiplied by a positive 3. You could have alternated where that negative is. But either way you get y equals 0. So your solution is 3 comma 0 or x equals 3 y equals 0. You can write it in any way you want. Um, I'm going to graph these are inequalities. So the Solution to these is going to be a certain section of a graph that's shaded in, but the second equation isn't in slope-intercept form, and I, I made a little mistake there. I put y is less than x minus 3, but on the left, I put it correctly. It's y is greater than x minus 3. I'll, I'll edit that after I graph these. 
So this is a, I graph the, the line, the, the, inter, the y-intercept, and I graph the slope. I do the same for the blue line. Negative 3 y-intercept, positive 1 slope. It's a dotted line. I'm going to shade uh, for the red line below because it's a less than. For the blue line, it's a y is greater than x minus 3. Shade above that. The places where I see red and blue is where the actual solution is. And just to make it neater, I'm going to erase the kind of uh, other lines I had just so it's not confusing. So the solution is just that yellow part. The first equation is an absolute value equation. Notice how this is like written backwards. Uh, it has the absolute value quality greater than y, but that means y is less than the absolute value part. Um, so when I'm shading, I'll make note of that. The second equation is just a line. Plot the y-intercept. The slope is go up 1 over 2. I want to shade below the absolute value equation because y is less than absolute value of x plus 3. I want to shade above the blue line, the linear equation. So the places where I see the red and the blue is going to be where my solution is. So it's going to be this highlighted yellow part right here. And I don't need those other stray markings, so I'll just erase those, get those out of the way. Your solution is just that part right here. This is um, a linear programming problem. So we're going to graph our constraints. Our constraints are all those inequalities there. I have to shade to the left of the red line. I have to shade below that y less than or equal to 4 is a horizontal line. I shade below. And these right here, instead of shading this as well, I'm just going to note that that means I'm in the first quadrant. So that's in the top right. I'm going to ignore the second, third, and fourth quadrant. So I'm going to shade left of the red, below the blue. So that spot right here is going to be where my solution is. The vertices are always going to be the possibilities for where you have a max or a min. So I'm going to test each of those points inside my objective function, 2x plus y. So I noticed that when I put 5, 4, or x equals 5, y equals 4, I get a max of 14. Because 2 times 5 plus 1 times 4 is 14. So your, your maximum is 14 at x equals 5, y equals 4. This one I can solve by hand, but it takes a while to do this system, even if I'm doing an elimination method or even using a matrix by hand. So I'm going to choose to use the aid of my calculator. I'm going to put that matrix into my calculator here. And then I'm going to use the RREF command. Uh, and that's going to give me the solutions. It's going to turn the left side into a, a identity matrix, like with the ones in the diagonals. And then it's going to give me uh, the solutions all the way to the right. So the X is 1, the Y is 3, the Z is 2. Now, if you want to know how to solve it by hand, that's an option available to you. You can just use elimination method. It's just elimination method with three equations. You add the first and the third equation together. It actually eliminates the X and the Y, so you just get Z. Well, that allows you to find Z, and we confirm that Z is 2. But now to get the y by itself, I rewrite that original system, but I replace this equation here, 0, 0, negative 1, negative 2, with the third equation. And I could just put a positive 1 and a positive 2 there, which I'll do um, later. But if I combine the second and the third equation, which I highlighted here in green and blue respectively, that one will eliminate the z uh, out of the second equation, and I can just replace that with the second equation. now. I can eliminate the z out of the first equation. And so eliminating the z out of the first equation um, uh, gets me closer to having my solution here. Then the first two equations just have the x and the y. z is only in the third equation. If you uh, eliminate the x out of the second equation here, then what I get is um, I get the solution for the y, which is y is equal to 3. 1 times y is equal to 3, which confirms what I did in my calculator anyway. Here I'm going to change that to a positive 1 and a positive 2, which is just essentially dividing by a negative 1. Now all that's left is to get this last um, uh, last line right here. Uh, sorry, I mistyped that thing in yellow at the top there. That's supposed to be 1, negative 1, 0, negative 2. So uh, let me erase that um, really quickly. And so I'm going to get, um, uh, I'm going to take that equation and the second equation and combine them to eliminate the y so that I just get x by itself. So that's 1, 0, 0, 1, which means 1 times x plus 0 times y plus 0 times z equals 1. 
So I just confirm x equals 1, y equals 3, z equals 2. This is what your calculator does. Your calculator just does it all at once. Um, the next one that we have is uh, I could solve it using a matrix again. You could do other methods, but in order to get it as a matrix, you got to get the x, y, and z on the left side. So you got to rewrite that third equation. So the row that represents that would be negative 2, 1, 1, 0, because um, you have to change the signs in the x and the y. Put that into your equation. Use your R, E, F command, and you get x equals 2, y equals negative 1. Z equals 5. You can write it as a ordered pair, a three-dimensional ordered pair if you want, but I prefer to just write it as X equals Y equals Z equals and put the values. Here, if we want to write a matrix representing this, the first two rows of the matrix are obvious. The third row of the matrix, remember that there's a zero in front of A because there's no A, there's no C, so there's zeros in those parts. And in front of B, that's not a zero, that's a one. That's a one B, uh, one in front of that B, and then I chose to use a uh, the R, E, F. I could use substitution method, but um, because B equals negative 1, that does make it easier, but I'm choosing not to. Here, um, for number 12, uh, this is more linear programming, but you don't necessarily have to use linear programming to solve this. I'm going to draw this graph part, even though it's unnecessary, but here's what I know. The small pizzas, which I'm going to choose X, I don't want to use the variable S, only because my S's look like 5's. The large pieces, my Y's, are between 100 and 40. The smalls are between 70 and 90. Now, I could write constraints like this. I could graph all three of these constraints. But I could just do this instead. I know that my um, smallest um, I know that my smallest amount of pieces is 90. Now, if I can have 210 pieces all together, that means if I have 90 smalls, that means there is, if I take 90 and subtract 210, that means there's 120 larges that I can make. If I make only 70 smalls and I subtract that from 210, that would be 140 larges I can make. And again, I got that from just doing 210 minus 70, 210 minus 90, so I don't have to graph these. Those are basically, basically going to be my two um, comparisons that I have for the maximum there. Um, because every other value, even though there are four vertices to this, um, those other values are going to just obviously give less money because there's, it's, it's better to make 70 smalls and 140 larges than 70 smalls and 100 larges. It's going to be obviously more profit that way. So really, even though I have four vertices, even though I didn't need to graph it, I could eliminate that first and fourth one. So now I'm just going to test my objective function, my profit function. I make a buck 50 profit for each small pizza. So it's a buck 50 times 70 small pizzas plus $2.15 profit for all of my large pizzas. So my profit there is $406. My profit in the other scenario, 90 smalls and 120 larges is $393. So 70 smalls, 140 larges is going to be the way I make my maximum profit there. They don't ask for the maximum profit, but I thought it would be useful to show how it is. Again, you don't need to necessarily graph this. Just a little bit of, um, you can just guess and check those two solutions. All right, this first uh, equation, $5,000 invested into three funds. I'm going to call those funds X, Y, and Z. Um, I'm going to call X the growth fund, Y the income fund, Z the money market fund. I, I could have used A, B, and C as well. This second statement, this is going to show like the interest that I generate. And the interest I generate, if I go from $5,000 to 5450 that means I gain $450 in interest, right? So my interest breakdown is going to be the interest of what I invest into one times how much I invest. So 12% times the first account, 8% times what I invest in the second account, uh, plus 5% times what I invest in the third account equals the $450 that I generated. The last one, which I have highlighted with the statement in green, if I invested twice as much into the income fund, which is the Y, as I did in the money market fund, which is the Z, that means y is two times as big as z. That means y is double of z, or y is 2z. Now, leaving it as y equals 2z, I don't like necessarily doing that. I'd rather put that in standard form. So if I write a matrix to solve this, everything is good except for the last equation. I'm going to get the 2z on the left side of the equal sign. There's no x. There's one y, and it's a negative 2z equals 0. 
and then I can now that I have my system right here, I can put that into my calculator, and I can use the row referenced echelon form, the RREF, and the uh, the math menu of the matrices, and you get that there should be two thousand dollars invested into the first fund, two thousand dollars invested into the second fund, and then one thousand dollars invested into that third fund. All right, for number fourteen, what I'm looking at is we have uh, I want to see when it's best to solve with system uh, equations with substitution. Either when you have a variable by itself solved, or when the coefficient on that variable is one, just to give it as an example, the first six problems of this study guide, notice how everything but problem two could very easily be done by substitution. Okay, again, it's just if there, there's a variable by itself, uh, a variable by itself or a coefficient of one in front of it. Um, this one's just sort of open-ended, just a little practice. When might you have a system that looks like a parallelogram? One of them, number eight, had that. Let me show you a different example. If you had two parallel lines, okay, and you wanted to shade between those parallel lines, but I need to block them off with their height, and I'm just randomly choosing five and two. But, well, how do I make constraint to shade this shape of a parallelogram? Well, I want to I want to shade below the five, above the two to get that, that height there. And I want to shade below the first red line, above the second red line, which just has a different y-intercept, and that would be your parallelogram. So that's the uh, solutions for the study guide.